Hey, what's going on? It's Doug Cunnington here, founder of Niche Site Project. In this interview, I talked to Jesse Lakes. That's the founder of Genius Link. Jesse and I talk about our sort of common Montana connection. We also talk about how he got started in affiliate marketing, identified a problem with affiliate tracking and solved the problem. He also landed a job at Apple somehow. It was actually a really cool story and I didn't know any of this before the interview. It was enlightening and actually Jesse and I sort of hit it off uh, pretty well. So I'm pretty sure if I can convince Jesse to come back, we'll do uh, some future collaborations and just have some discussions and that sort of thing. If you aren't familiar with Genius Link, well, you're in for a treat. But I want to also mention that Genius Link makes localizing, tracking, and managing smart links very simple so you can earn more without adding more work. So for Amazon affiliates, Genius Link could be the perfect solution to help you localize your links for geo-targeting and take advantage of the international associates programs out there. And if you have some other you know, links that you need to take care of, perhaps you are an author or a content creator on YouTube, for example, um, it could be a great way for you to localize your links and just have a way to track your links in a little bit of a uh, more sophisticated way. Without further ado, let's check out the interview with Jesse Lakes. Hey, what's going on? It's Doug Huntington here from Niche Site Project, and I am chatting with uh, Jesse Lakes. How are you today? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm doing great. Doing great. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, you're from Genius Link, of course, and I've been a fan of Genius Link. I've known about Genius Link for years, and you sh shot me an email a little while back, did a little intro. We have a bit of a connection. So I think um, without going too deep on that thread, can you give the folks a little intro just about yourself personally and kind of how you ended up at Genius Link and that sort of thing? For sure. So it all started in Montana, which I think is what you're hitting at there. Um, so way, way back in the good old days, um, I ran a series of websites that took soundtracks from extreme sports films. And I used the iTunes and Amazon affiliate program to, to earn revenue from those. Um, and it was a great project after school. Obviously, growing up in Montana, the, uh, the outdoors are an important part of, uh, of growing up. But it was from those websites I saw this really peculiar trend that kind of led down this very interesting path. But I had this nice hockey stick growth in traffic. But surprisingly, my revenue was growing very, very slowly, very linearly. Um, and my aha moment when realized, was when I realized that um, my website traffic had really evolved. I now had just a ton of traffic coming internationally. Uh, and the oh no moment came shortly afterwards when I realized that all that international traffic was being sent to the US iTunes store and Amazon.com where they essentially couldn't buy the, uh, the songs that I was recommending. So those links were essentially broken for them. So that kind of led to this whole concept of, well, what if I had a smart link and based off someone's geography or device, or, you know, et cetera, that I could help make them help direct them to the right place to buy. If they click on a link, they have an intent to purchase. What can I do to help make that process to purchase as, as easy as possible? So that started this kind of process of, of um, putting together a company. Um, at the same time, though, again, these soundtrack websites, iTunes was my big winner. Um, iTunes was doing really well for me, and I drank the apple Kool-Aid many years ago. So I took all these notes um, from, from working on the, the website and the iTunes affiliate program and actually put them into a, a book. Um, and I put this book together, was about ready to publish, found some people on uh, LinkedIn, sent them a copy of the book saying, hey, you, know, you have an amazing affiliate program. I think you'd really appreciate all this essentially missing documentation. And of course, Apple responded with a cease and desist. Um, so I went from you know, thinking I was helping solve their problems to uh, a threat of getting sued. So that was kind of this, this crazy wake up call. So hop on the phone with the, the woman that sent the, uh, the note. You know, the first 30 seconds were very civil and polite. And then the next 45 minutes, there was a lot of screaming back and forth. The gist was is, you know, who, who are you to, uh, to tell us you know, about all these things with the affiliate program these must be all lies. This must be just a ton of misinformation. Do not publish this book because you're just going to create more work for us. I was like, ah, sorry, I think you'll actually find that I put a ton of time into researching this. Take a look at the book. So uh, we agreed to give it, you know, 45 days before I published. They were going to review it, et cetera. Um, so fast forward a couple of weeks, I uh, get an email back. There was, you know, essentially three errors. I, I had someone's name wrong. Uh, I had a couple of the minor details wrong in regards to which program we um, mapped to which affiliate network. 
Um, and then they asked me to pull out someone's email address. I was like, oh, okay. Shortly after that, they offered me a job um, to actually run their affiliate program. So previously, I was a whitewater raft guide during the summer and spring, or sorry, summer and, and winter, going between Colorado and Costa Rica. Um, and this was kind of my chance to, to go and have a commute and work in Cupertino. So I'm glad I continued with the sea theme, but it was a very different shift there. Um, so, of course, I, I said yes, you know, again, being an Apple fanboy. So I went and spent a couple of years at, at iTunes working on their marketing team, actually, as the global project manager of their affiliate program. And just really saw this problem from the other side. It was a really interesting perspective. Uh, we were able to double the size of the affiliate program, uh, which was great for a lot of different reasons, but it made this problem that I had started to solve earlier that much worse. Uh, at the same time, I saw Amazon was doing it as well. So again, while I loved my time in, at, at Apple and Cupertino, um, I just saw this problem that I had a fundamental passion for get significantly worse and it was time to uh, say goodbye and, and double down. So. Uh, the company was originally GeoRiot. We, uh, we evolved into Genius Link, uh, started off iTunes focused, added Amazon, and then opened up to be a quote unquote intelligent link management platform that uh, does a lot of different things for a lot of different people. But yeah, so sorry, that was that was not a short, short response. Well, I was going to say uh, that was a very like tight elevator pitch <laughs> answer at the beginning. And then I was like, my mind, you know, uh, was blown there. Uh, so you you had a site. And you were, you, you were like, hey, let's do this uh, affiliate program. You ID'd the problem. You wrote a book on it. And then Apple was like, what are you talking about? And then they <laughs> hired you after they mm -hmm. realized that you were smart and you knew what you were talking about. Turns out a 160-page book is the best resume you could have. <laughs> I try to keep it to like one page. But yeah, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds good. Um, that's amazing. So what year was that when you got started with your first sites? So started the sites in 2007, 2006, maybe um, 2006, 2007, 2008. And then Apple uh, was a contractor in 2009 and joined. Um, I got the full time gig in 2010, 2011, and then went full time geo riot in early 2012. OK, super cool. That, yeah, that's amazing. I did not know the history at all. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. So did you have like a coding background in the past or what's your sort of educational background? So I always, you know, I watched, I watched hackers as a middle schooler, right? And that was like, oh, wow, computers can do these amazing things. Uh, and that kind of, I already had an interest in, in computers to begin with that kind of like, you know, pushed me towards the whole internet, trying to understand, you know, Knowing that curiosity was a was a very important thing. High school, um, you know, was the star student in my class as far as uh, writing code went. Um, but as soon as I got to college, it just I got my butt kicked so badly and uh, went from starting off as a CS major to uh, actually ending up in business information systems. <laughs> it was just kind of you know, hid with my my tail between my legs. You know, it, I was much better at using the programs than actually writing them. But my my best friend um, growing up, who also was a college roommate, you know, really clicked with the CS thing. So. I, I don't, I can write code, but you know, as we start really kind of pushing on this, uh, the geo write thing, I, I had less and less access to being able to write code. They kind of slowly pushed me out. So today I don't even have access to the database. I don't write any code, but, um, I understand enough to get me in trouble and ask questions, but yeah, I, I definitely can't write code myself. Okay. Gotcha. And where, where did you go to school? Uh, University probably. of Montana, of course. Okay, cool, cool. And, uh, yeah, we could, um, go on a slight tangent right now and just talk about Montana a bit. So we're, um, so, so you're from Montana originally, like born and everything. Born in Whitefish, grew up in Hamilton, went to school in Missoula. Yeah. Okay, cool. Very cool. And I spent a little time in Whitefish, like my wife and I were working remotely and we were traveling at the time and we wanted to, we lived in Atlanta, we're from Atlanta. Okay. We wanted to like go to Montana, but we are now, uh, you know, our now deceased dog, we traveled with him. So we were like, oh, we're driving everywhere we go. And um, we're like, we're just going to hang out and whitefish for like a month, um, which was amazing. Um, it was like just awesome. before the season starts. Um, so like May, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a little cool, like not quite, you know, so busy in town there. And it's beautiful. Just amazing. Really like the town there. So yeah. Um, yeah. But then so, you ended up in Bozeman. Yep. And ended up in Bozeman. Um, we were actually going to move to where I live now, but I guess we took like a four year detour in Bozeman, which was amazing, you know, very similar to Boulder um, mm -hmm. and a lot of other sort of close to the mountain towns. 
And yeah. Um, yeah, less traffic. So we hung out in Bozeman for a while, but my wife uh, recently got a new job down here in Colorado, which is great. You know, we like it down here as well. So. Well, GeoRiot slash UnionSync was conceived in, in Denver. I was living in Fort Collins. So, yeah, again, not only do we have the Montana connection, we have that Colorado connection as well. It's uh, Having close access to the outdoors, I think, really does help iterate faster for the tech ideas when you can go hike and enjoy some fresh air. I think it, uh, some of the best ideas come, come from that, at least in my, my opinion. Me, t- me too. Yeah, it's like it's great. I could go walk outside. There's trail systems everywhere and I don't have to cross roads or anything. I can go out with um, the new dog now and, <laughs> um, you know, look at the mountains in the distance. So, yeah, I, I agree. And it's, it's good people, too. You know, yeah. we kind of gravitate towards those areas. So, OK, getting back on track <laughs> a little bit. So you saw the need you started. Um, like, I guess, like, how did the company get started? Like, um, like once, once you were like, all right, we're doing this, um, for real full time, leaving Apple. Yeah. So we, we started with, you know, I had the problem. So I knew I I was, you know, the, the perfect customer to begin with. So I knew how to solve the problem with the websites. Um, but we started to just kind of iterate it. You know, again, I left Apple. I was able to focus on it full time. Um, my fiance at the time, um, was also at Apple. She was also from Colorado, um, but she was an engineer. So we had Jesse P, the other Jesse, who again was my best friend growing up, college roommate, the engineer. He went to Microsoft, um, was able to kind of iterate on the, the, the idea nights and weekends. But Shannon and I, we left Apple. We were able to really focus in on it. And we, we spent, you know, essentially the first year, um, not putting a monetization model around it and just kind of wanted to build a platform to solve our problem to kind of help people out. We were able to organically bring in a few people. We were very unique in that there was really didn't have any other competitors in the iTunes space. Um, we knew the problem fundamentally just, again, I, I had the, the site, but I also working from, from Apple saw and, and kind of understood some of the, the challenges from the inside as well. Um, but we just, yeah, cl- slowly, very organically grew it. A couple people here, a couple people there. We were really fortunate. Uh, Again, we focused on, we started in the music space, but iTunes supports multiple media types. During that era was like the crazy Angry Birds app store. You know, everyone can be a, an app renewer. You know, um, and we ended up, for better or worse, connecting with a couple of mobile ad networks um, that use the affiliate program to help monetize those, those app recommendations. So we had two massive clients that just kind of showed up out of the woodwork and really kind of helped helped us grow. So, um, that first year, you know, Shan and I coming out of Apple, we were very fortunate that we didn't need to take a salary. Um, we were able to kind of let the, the money from the company pile on at the end of that year. Jesse P left his day job. We, we've worked out a, you know, had a monetization profile or monetization plan figured out. Um, and it just, it slowly built upon itself. But I think having that time, having that patience to, to kind of build upon it was, was absolutely essential. Um, yeah, they kind of talk about how, entrepreneurship is, you know, jumping off a cliff and building a parachute or building a plane as you go. We were fortunate enough where we could look over the cliff and know what we were looking at and didn't quite jump until we had at least the basic plans of the parachute and the plane put together beforehand. Um, so we were, again, very, things worked out really well for us. We, we definitely are not like others where it was, it was forced upon us. We, yeah, very blessed, I guess I should say that. Right. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's, um, that's more my style, especially my wife. She's very risk averse. And it's like, not only do we have a a parachute, we have like two backups each, like that's how conservative she is. So that's, I mean, that's great that you had time. You don't have to rush. I think, um, I'll put words in your mouth, but you can make better decisions that are more long-term if you're not like, how are we going to pay rent this month? That kind of exactly. Thing. So. You're seeing vision, you're executing a vision instead of just chasing money and chasing money is a lot of movement, but less direction. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well put, well put. Um, so you mentioned Shannon, that's, um, mm-hmm. your wife, that's now. the wife and co-founder. Yeah. Okay. So did she do a lot of the coding early on or how did you guys like build it? Yeah. So the three of us had a, a pretty good split, right? So I was everything but coding. So all the marketing, all the sales, all the support, et cetera. Shannon kind of took over the, um, the dashboard side of things. So all of the, um, yeah, the tools to build the links to, to manage the affiliate programs, to give the reports, et cetera. And then Jesse P, um, he built all the service pieces, all the behind the scenes, making sure things worked and dealt with all of our infrastructure. So it worked out really well where we had our kind of three clean divisions. Obviously there was overlap 
here and there, but it, um, we each kind of had a mandate and we ran with it. Okay. Gotcha. And then if I can ask, how big is the team now? So we are 10, 11 here in a few weeks. Uh, we just got a, a, another job offer accepted and uh, we'll keep, yeah, building, building the team slowly but surely. Okay, cool. And has it just been um, like small growth as you identify a need and then you're like, okay, this role needs to be filled or h- how did you deal with it from an HR perspective and a corporate org chart kind of thing? <laughs> Yeah, that's so we're we're bootstrapped. Yeah, we've all, we've been very fortunate again to kind of have revenue relatively early on. We never had to take any investment, um, and that's allowed us to kind of move at our own speed, uh, for better or worse. Um, but also kind of allows us to make make some mistakes only at one headcount or two at a time. So, yeah, it's it's been really kind of slow. We we built up. Um, you know, some of the engineering were some of the first hires just to kind of help. Um, some of the first full-time hires, I should say, just to kind of help move us forward. There was a lot of vision that needed to be executed on as far as the um, uh, building out a better platform. Um, and we, again, were one of the first movers. Um, my background with Apple definitely kind of helped. So we we didn't have to work as hard from an SEO perspective or, or um, a biz development perspective. People, people that knew that there was a problem typically very organically found us. So my job was relatively easy early on. Um, that being said, you know, was able to, to hire my brother, uh, after, after a couple of years, which was, was great. Um, you know, again, you, you might know some trends here where it's a very close knit team or has been a very close knit team where my brother, my wife, my best friend, um, my, our bookkeeper is, is Jesse P's mom. Um, you know, our head infrastructure guy was his cousin, uh, Shannon's sister worked for us for a period. So, uh, it, we, we were able to kind of, you know, bring in people that, we knew and trusted and wanted to help us out as well. So that really kind of, you know, from the HR perspective, some people say, you know, never hire a relative or, or a spouse, but um, we broke all those rules and it worked relatively well. Um, but there's always kind of ups and downs with that as well. People's founders are always going to be hundred percent committed. Your, your employees may be some, something less than that. And they may have the awesome commitment for a while, but it's not, it's not their life's dream. Um, it's not their life's work. So um yeah, there was some some challenging times, but it's worked out. Yeah, we ha- have great relationships with all the the family members uh, that worked with us in the past, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's I'm, what I'm I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you there. I was going to say no, no. I couldn't. Um, I don't think my wife and I could work together. Like uh, I'm, well, I'm pretty sure she would say that, and she's mentioned it a couple of times. But um, uh, I think in, in another way, um, she keeps me in check because, like, mm-hmm. you know. I don't have any good ideas. Uh, yeah, yeah. She, she doesn't watch you or listen to any of these. So I can say, say stuff like that. I'm just kidding. Of course we have, we have a fine relationship. So move back on track. So we, mm-hmm. we've talked about um, genius link and the origin of the company, but for the lay person, a, a lot mm-hmm. of folks in my audience, um, either they're just getting started with affiliate marketing or um, they're thinking about it. Um, so what does genius link actually do? Like, what does it help someone? That's a great question. And the answer varies depending on who's asking it. And that's for better or worse. We've, we've evolved. We've been able to kind of move the platform, but in the early days we had a very simple problem and that was what we call geo fragmentation. It's the idea that iTunes has affiliate programs and storefronts around the world, uh, but their links were very country and affiliate program specific. So if you are, if you have a link for the U.S. store, uh, a song in the U.S. iTunes store, and someone from Germany clicks on it, it's a dead-end buying experience. You're not going to earn commission. They can't buy the song. It just doesn't work. So we built a quote-unquote intelligent link platform where, again, based off of the person's geography, we could find that same product in their local store and then use the a proper affiliate program to, to affiliate that. Uh, and that that tied over perfectly with Amazon, right? Amazon is now 13 different storefronts, or sorry, 15 different storefronts are up. 16, they just added United Arab Emirates, um, 16 storefronts around the world, 13 affiliate programs. Each of those storefronts are independent. Um, if you are coming from the United Arab Emirates and you click on an Amazon.com link, it, it's still going to let you shop at Amazon.com, but you're going to deal with taxes and fees and higher shipping costs and foreign currency, you know, foreign language, etc. where if you go to a local storefront that Amazon has spent billions of dollars optimizing for that local audience, you're likely going to have, again, that, that more seamless buying experience. There's going to be less friction. When you reduce friction, you typically see a, a re- improvement in conversion rates. So again, one link works across all the different Amazon ecosystems 
pretty much flawlessly. You tweet out a link for a new pair, a new speaker or a new uh, microphone. We're going to make sure that your fans around the world, um, they can buy it and they can, you can be remunerated from Amazon from the different affiliate programs. Okay. Um, and that's expanded. There's, there's many other stories as well. You know, BMW is a client, but they don't use anything with Amazon. Intel's a client, but they do something else completely as well. Um, so it's a, uh, there's okay. this, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, sure. So, um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll sort of restate it to make sure I understand and the audience folks uh, would understand too. So if um, I have a, m- most people are the, that are watching this from, from my side are Amazon affiliate um, mm-hmm. folks. So um, say I have an Amazon store, it's like um, ballpointpens.com or something, right? That's mm-hmm. the example I often use. And then there's someone from, let's say the UK that ends up mm-hmm. on my site. They read a review and if I don't have um, a solution for geo-targeting in place, um, mm-hmm. the user from the UK clicks it and then they have a bad buying experience because they end up on the US store and they're like, ah, I'm not, maybe the product isn't even there, right? Maybe it's mm-hmm. not even available. However, in this, uh, when you have a solution in place that takes care of the geo-targeting, the UK visitor is routed to the UK store for Amazon mm-hmm. and um and then they buy something. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And you'll get, earn your commission because you're you know, using the Amazon UK affiliate program with the Amazon UK store, et cetera. So yeah. two different pieces, user experience, monetization. You need to let both those work together seamlessly to really maximize the, the monetization on your mid and long tail. I'm getting back to buzzword bingo. I should, sure. you, you did a much better job. Yeah, recapping. it's okay. It's, it's good to have because there's, there's many different levels, uh, obviously, within the audience. So some people like know exactly what we're talking about and they want us to move on. And then some other people are, are just getting it. So with, with that said, um, is there some like actually for your early sites, when you ID mm-hmm. the problem, how do you remember the percentage of traffic that was international where you realized, Oh man, like I'm only making, you know, a fraction of what I should. Yeah, it was, it was pretty significant. It was like 50%, 60% international traffic at that point. Um, which was, Crazy. Um, I, yeah, I built the site in English, you know, for, you know, U.S. based films, but skiing, snowboarding, surfing are international sports. There was a massive international audience. Got it. But it's really, if I can take that one step further, what we found is that if you have anywhere from 10 percent on of international traffic, this is something you should start take, thinking about. And on average, for every 10 percent of international traffic that you have, you can add 5% to your bottom line for the affiliate program. So to take that step further, 50% um, international traffic, 50% US traffic, let's say you're making $1,000 a month. In theory, adding on the some sort of geo-targeting solution should add another $250 um, on top of that. So 5% of 10%, 10% times five, yeah, so 25%, 25% of a thousand bucks, 250. So that's $250 of money that you were leaving on the table before. Um, because you weren't dealing with the international piece. Now you can put that in your pocket, should be put it in your pocket. Got it. And I can, um, I can say that that's true because for many awesome. years I did not, um, I can, maybe not the exact numbers, but basically, mm-hmm. um, you know, there wasn't a good solution in place. It was clunky. Um, you know, maybe I didn't like the other plugins or whatever. Um, but you know, finding and th- this is what i do i, I suspect you, you know you would agree with this approach but uh let me know if you disagree so uh, <laughs> when i when i looked at my analytics um i was like ah you know what it's not worthwhile right now i i can mm-hmm. see um there's not quite enough traffic and mm-hmm. i can see that it's getting close so once the uk and canada so those are the only other two international groups that i'm dealing with but mm-hmm. the us uh, or sorry uh, canada and the uk and mm-hmm. um, once I implemented it, it was like pretty much instant. Um, like people were routed properly. They were buying stuff and uh, literally additionally, no, no work. Um, and it was a no brainer, you know, and mm-hmm. I wish I, I did it sooner. So um, prioritization, prioritization is always a challenge. Go ahead. I yeah, you. yeah. And that's exactly right. Like there were other things I had to worry about. So um, in, in slightly more granular, a lot of the, a lot of the time I'll tell people, um, actually, let me step back. People will approach me and say, um, I want to 
increase money or increase my income or improve conversions or something like that. And sometimes mm-hmm. folks that have that question, they just don't have enough traffic yet. So sometimes mm-hmm. I tell them, you know, you're not going to be able to squeeze anything else out of, you know, 15 visitors a day, just not. Right. Um, so the threshold, a lot of times that I'm telling people is like, if you can get say, you know, 50 to a hundred unique visitors um, per month, is that, is that the, is it per month um, from an international, uh, say the UK, then go ahead and you're probably going to be able to start making a little bit of money. And if you, you know, if you grow your, your traffic, you should be able to grow that into a bigger piece. It should grow proportionally. So do you guys make it a little more granular or the 10% rule is kind of what you're looking for? 10% is typically easiest. Education is such an important thing, but education overload can be a challenge. But let me just take what you said and, and kind of flip it on the other side. And that's that you have to sign up for each of the Amazon programs independently, right? And that's, it's the exact same form as you do for amazon.com. Um, so it's really easy to do. And if you do the UK, you can do the other, um, the other four in Europe very quickly. But for each program, I think you have, to, there's a requirement of having at least three sales in 90 days. So if you can't generate three sales in 90 days, they're going to kick you out of the program due to inactivity. So back to your, your thing about having, making sure you have enough international traffic. Well, what is your conversion rate? If you're getting, you know, 1% conversion rate, then you need at least a hundred clicks you know, per month in each of those storefronts. If you can't hit that, then there's you know, likely you're going to get your, your account, you know, closed because of that inactivity. So yeah, at least 100 or 200 clicks. But if you're converting at you know 20%, then you know you need significantly less clicks to to be able to get those those sales. So, sorry, that wasn't a <laughs> black and white answer, but it's uh, varies depending on on kind of that, that traffic and conversion rate. That, that's perfect though, because it's actually looking like at the data that a person has. Um, they know their conversion rate. They can see what traffic they have, and it's like okay, if you're not getting enough, don't even waste your time. Um, there is. There is a little bit of um, overhead with the admin. Um, like you mm-hmm. said, you have to sign up for the program, which isn't a huge deal. You have to be able to accept the payments as well. And that can be challenging for certain geographies. There's um, some good solutions to that. We can get to that later, but go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, sure. We, no, we could actually flow into that. I mean, um, what, what were you going to say? Oh, just I, I have fallen so deeply in love with Payoneer that it's uh, it's it's kind of sad. Um, so, as you said, Amazon initially was a real challenge. I had to go to the bank, stand in line with all these foreign currency checks and get the the oddest looks from the tellers of how am I supposed to deposit this, you know, X amount of Canadian dollars or euros or, or, or whatnot. And that was the biggest frustration. I hated doing it. It was just it was horrible. Um, so I wouldn't do it. And I'd you know, get six months worth of checks sitting there and then the checks would be stale and you'd, it just became a nightmare. But Payoneer, if for those that don't know, is a, a great, it's kind of PayPal on steroids, right? So they allow you to have a digital wallet more or less, but they, to get money into that digital wallet, they give you different, um, I just got some weird, okay, you still there? Mm-hmm. Okay, oh, sorry. Uh, things are going haywire with Google file drive. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Payoneer allows you to have this, this um, digital wallet where you have different receiving accounts. And those receiving accounts can be in different countries and different currencies. So I have a receiving account for Canada. So I can put in my Canadian bank account via Payoneer so that Amazon can now pay me directly with a direct deposit instead of issuing a, a check. Same thing for euros, um, uh, Japanese yen, et cetera. So Payoneer allows you to, to seamlessly take those commissions from all those international programs put them into your digital wallet and then uh, cash out your digital wallet into your U.S. bank account. So I no longer get cash checks or sorry, paper checks. I no longer have to stand in the line. The people at Chase don't glare at me anymore. Life is so much better. Um, yeah, that's that's my love affair with uh, with Payoneer. There are some challenges. Mexico is uh, they're a little bit slow. They've just ramped that up. They don't do anything for India. India is a big one. We've got a different solution for that. But you're absolutely right. There is definitely some administrative challenges, but um, we have written some thorough documentation in our years of figuring that out. Hopefully those challenges are as easy as just following steps now instead of having to figure this out. But that was a massive problem in the early days. How do we get money out of Japan? How do we get money out of India? You know, we've made all these commissions, but I can't actually spend them. I can't pay my employees. I can't pay you know, my, my, my rent or myself because the money is stuck in these countries. Right. Um, but thankfully we've worked through those. Yep. And I was going to say the, they Amazon be, being they um, have allowed direct deposit at least for the UK and Canada, which was a great help for me because I was getting checks um, mm-hmm. from those. And like you said, 
it's a little bit of a challenge. And then sometimes there's extra fees depending on your bank and all that. So I was paying extra fees yeah. and or just, I was like, don't pay me until I have a lot, of, a big check. So it's a smaller percentage of it. So exactly. Yeah. Um, the Amazon stuff was just rolled out a few months ago, if I'm not mistaken, which is obviously takes a little of the, uh, the thunder away from Payoneer. But again, however you can get that money into your account. Awesome. You know, earning the commissions is one thing, being able to spend the commissions. That's what really matters. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, some of the rule, uh, obviously, since you guys work so closely with Amazon, um, associates, you, you're pretty well versed in the rules and stuff like that. Um, we were chatting before I hit record and I recently went through, uh, an audit with the Amazon team. Everything was fine. Um, not a ton of interaction with the team, but everyone was super polite that I talked to. Um, but as far as rules and, and maybe some violations that people make, what are some of the common ones that you see? And you can maybe give some folks tips on those. For sure. So first and foremost, I so strongly encourage people to sit down, make themselves comfortable and read Amazon's app operating agreement. It's, it's not a page turner. It's, it's, it's dense. It's legalese. They've actually done a better job than some of the other ones, but that's, that's the rules of the game that you play by. And if you don't know the rules of the game, you're eventually going to lose. So just please take some time to actually go through that. Um, we've written some blogs. Now there's other people have written blogs as well. Use those as kind of a, um, an addition. Um, but at the end of the day, you're responsible for understanding the operating agreement because that's what they pay you out based on. So first and foremost, please play by the rules, et cetera. But what are those rules? You know, what, what are some of the, 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 the hints and so forth? So uh, we were fortunate enough to work with um, a handful of people to put together a kind of top 10 uh, reasons that the uh, people get kicked out of the affiliate program. And kind of the first and foremost is uh, kind of what they consider cloaking or um, not helping inspire consumer trust. And that really affects us specifically. Uh, again, you know, Genius Link is a tool to help people um, monetize their international traffic. For our magic to work, you have to use a Genius Link. Uh, the link is not an Amazon link. It's, it's our, it runs through our domain so that we can do the uh, link translation, auto affiliation, et cetera. But when you place a link that isn't an Amazon link, you need to disclose that. And that's a an really important thing, especially when you're putting links on social media. So if you're putting links on YouTube, et cetera, you know, buy on Amazon and then a link that is not an Amazon link. So whether it's Genius Link or a Bitly link or something else, it's really important that you let consumers know where they're going to go. That, that consumer trust is really important and probably the biggest issue that we run into. And it's an unfortunate one because it's so easy just to drop a link in there. But uh, whether it's your website and you say buy on Amazon or you hover over it and it shows the Amazon link in the status bar, whatever it may be, it's really important that you let consumers know where they're going when they click on that link. And okay. consider it big or small. Unfortunately, that's probably the reason that we see people um, get the audit emails uh, more, more often than not. So that's probably the number one. Number two is um, offline use, quote unquote, offline use of the link. You cannot put an affiliate link in an email. You cannot put an affiliate link in a PDF. You cannot put an affiliate link uh, somewhere essentially that you cannot get refer information to be passed through. Amazon wants to know where those links are placed. It's really important they have a holistic view of how you're using the affiliate program. So it's really important that when you place a link that, again, the refer information should pass through with all of, you know, incognito browsing security etc um, that refer information may not always be passed through but now we're getting in the weeds but the idea is that it should be something where it can go through so um don't put a link in in your email in your newsletter etc uh put a link to a landing page or put a link to your, your blog or your website and then link off to amazon but please don't put a link directly in your, your email because that unfortunately can get you in trouble um, probably the third one is then um, around static pricing or reviews or, or star ratings, et cetera. Amazon's really particular about um, using any sort of static information in association with how you display that. So uh, if you're going to put a price of a product, um, you need to, according to the terms of service, it needs to be updated within 24 hours. The best way to do that is with a product advertising API. And on top of that, the best way to do that is using one of the plugins that tie into that. So don't just copy and paste directly from the site. Make sure that that information is dynamic. And that one, I think, has a very legit concern. If Amazon changes the price, you don't want to be quoting the wrong price, either too high or too low. It's, it's really important, again, for that consumer trust, something that they really, really important to them, that it flows through um, very cleanly. Same with reviews. You, know, you say this has a five-star review on Amazon, and 
they discovered actually is lead paint and all of a sudden has a one-star review. Again, there's that consumer trust just erodes. Um, so those are kind of the highlights. There's definitely some other ones when, in regards to uh, affiliate disclosure is really important, making sure that the products are actually alive, um, making sure you're not just pushing free Kindle eBooks or free products, um, that you're actually pushing, pushing things that uh, will help you. That's less of a concern now that the Amazon has kind of revised their, their commission rates, et cetera. Um, sure. I'm sure there's another one in there, but that's, that's the, the quick brain dump. Okay. Well, and that's great. Like I said, I recently went through the audit and, um, as a post audit exercise, I, I wrote a blog post and, and shared a lot of information and a lot of people have questions about those things specifically. Um, and I do, I want to go back and revisit a couple of those. So, so mm -hmm. number one, you said, uh, like the cloaking of links. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know I've, I've heard this in the past, mm -hmm. um, from, you know, internet comments or some trolls in a Facebook group or something like that. So I don't know how accurate it was. <laughs> um, no, obviously not very accurate, but the point is people were like, oh, genius link is cloaking the links that is not allowed. Right. So I know, I know it's the worst thing. And you're like, no, no, guys, uh, like that is not right. So my interpretation is the important thing is a person, a visitor um, should know that they're going to Amazon and that it's um, an affiliate link. Right. Mm -hmm. From an FTC um, mm -hmm. perspective as well. Like mm -hmm. you're an affiliate. Uh, you have to disclose like the relationship so that people know that you're making money from it. And from Amazon's perspective that. Um, a, a visitor is going to Amazon. They don't want visitors on their site thinking that Amazon is tr tricking them to get them over to Amazon. Um, so, so that's my understanding. Disclo mm -hmm. like as long as you disclose it and um, people know what to expect, then you're in good shape. And, and feel free to pepper in. Is that understanding correct? Exactly. A link shortener is perfectly acceptable by Amazon. You can use any link shortener. You can use any domain, et cetera. You just have to disclose in your proximity that that link is going to Amazon. So us, our competitors, something else completely, something you build yourself. It doesn't matter what that link looks like as long as, again, close proximity. So in the anchor text, you know, before it, after it, just saying, you know, buy on Amazon, check price on Amazon. Amazon, a logo of Amazon, something, that's all that matters. Um, and just, you know, it's so unfortunate, you know, people, we've heard the same troll comments and it's, you know, again, we've been very blessed with, with the company. We support some of the largest sites in the world um, that are Amazon affiliates. We have a massive amount of Amazon traffic running through our, our, our service. We, you know, we work with many thousands of clients. We genius link is not a violation of the Amazon affiliate program. Sorry to yeah, sorry, hammer on that. It's just one of my pet peeves that we worked so hard to, to make sure that everyone is clean. Um, everyone is good, that those relationships are, are rock solid. And unfortunately, yeah, you get the trolls, but I guess that's the whole point of a troll is to get under your skin. Sure. Well, and thanks for humoring, humoring me there. Of Obviously course. I knew the answer to that. Um, but that's people a good question. want to know like explicitly, and exactly why. And, and that's why, because like, like we said, there's disclosure and there's expectations and a good customer experience is what we're looking for. Um, so very, and, and the rest of this stuff, um, you know, pretty common Men mentioning prices. You don't want to do that. Um, there are many tools out there that can help you access the advertising API to pull that mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. Um, so th this is slightly a bit of a tangent, um, but related. So I know, um, there are a lot of tools out there that help you say, pull images, pull mm -hmm. the ratings or, or, or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, does genius link have any capability to help you get images? Uh, that's a big concern for some people in the audience. Yeah. So we, we are super focused, um, that link translation piece is really, really important to us. Um, we've expanded upon that a little bit and let me speak to that in just a second, but we have worked closely with other plugins and there's a couple plugins that we strongly recommend where you can take advantage of their best in class. They're really focused on making sure you have great um, visuals on your website. It's easy, you know, plug and play, um, you know, plugins you drop in, you can quickly can uh, bring things up. You know, Easy Azon is one of those. Uh, Chris, the, uh, the founder of that company, is awesome. Um, on the other side, AAWP is another one that we really recommend. We just post a blog about um, how easy it is for those two tools to work together, us and them, uh, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we're really focused on making sure that link 
works across the board. And that in itself is a, a full-time job. There's a lot of behind the scenes magic to make sure that when you recommend that microphone, either when the ASIN changes or the language changes, we can find that same microphone in Japan, in Germany, et cetera, so that those links work cleanly. That's, that's what gets us excited. That's what we really focus on. Bridging the two topics, the last two conversations, we have really started pushing on a new uh, format, which we call choice pages. So again, Amazon compliance is super important. Uh, having some basic information about the product is also super important. So something that we've seen just explode in the music space and really starting to take off in the book space is this concept of a optimized landing page that includes some information about a product that allows one or more buy buttons below uh, for music, obviously it's stream buttons, uh, et cetera. So we've been pushing hard on this, this, yeah, we call them choice pages, but you know, pivot pages, commerce pages, they have a handful of different names depending on what service you're using. Um, but the idea that instead of having to disclose on your YouTube comments or in your Twitter feed, the affiliate disclosure and or the buy on Amazon, the idea is you drop a link to a choice page. We're going to take care of all those, those compliance issues, make sure it's hundred percent compliant with no work on your side, but also give you, you know, pull automatically from the Amazon's API to make sure the image is there and make sure the description is there. Price is going to be something hopefully coming out later this year, et cetera. So again, WordPress plugins, we have a couple, but at the end of the day, that's not our forte. We'd much rather you use someone that does it really well and then use ours on top of that to make sure the link translation is taken care of. But there's kind of that middle ground with these choice pages where we're really trying to help make sure that the consumer has a great user experience and also make sure that you stay in, in good compliance as well. Sure. So the choice page, uh, where does that live? Where is that? So that's that's on the Genius domain, right? So you'll have a Genius link, right? So Genius slash check out my microphone. Uh, you click on that. It's going to pull up a, a landing page. Um, that landing page is again mobile optimized, super simplified. It's it's built with a landing page of mine, minim, minimal options, very clean, you know, call to action, etc. And then you'll have maybe just one button for Amazon, or maybe it's a button for Amazon and Best Buy and Target, or you know, if it's getting clicked from the UK, it'll be your top three retailers from the UK again. Uh, can kind of pepper those things in and then those links so those buy buttons will then you know take advantage of our technology to send people on to the, the final destination okay cool that makes sense yeah that's pretty cool i actually wasn't aware of that new functionality pretty nice so let me just if i if i may have the uh the soapbox for a moment further um we we love Amazon, right? Amazon has, is a, a massive ecosystem. They've done an incredible job with the global dominance. Um, they, they, they do affiliate really well. Um, but as you've seen yourself, there's, there's some risk mitigation an affiliate should do as well. Um, it's no matter how good of an ecosystem it is, it's dangerous to put all your eggs in just a single basket. If your website only had Amazon links, you're putting a lot of faith that, you know, the people that you talk to during an Amazon audit, are having a good day. Yeah, there's, there's, again, from the risk mitigation side, there's too many things that could unfortunately sink your ship and sink your ship very quickly. Should Amazon find one little thing or not, you know, you didn't see it because you didn't see the email because you were on vacation. I think they only give you what, three or five days to, to remedy everything. And then after that, it's really hard to get back in the good graces. So one of the things that we've seen firsthand with not only ourselves, but also our client is that you know, you should help diversify your affiliate revenue. And that's also another piece of that, that choice page. Um, giving your clients uh, options is is good, right? Um, Amazon is 50% market share in the US. That's a massive amount of market share. That also means that there's 50% you could still optimize for. You know, not everyone is a prime member. Some people still prefer Walmart or Target, et cetera. So if you're promoting a single product and you have a buy button for Amazon, and a buy button for Walmart, a buy button for your third choice, you're kind of, optimizing across the board. You're, you're diversifying your revenue. You're helping the consumer with choice. Again, you're affiliate compliant. That's kind of the future where we see affiliate marketing going the relatively near future is, again, Amazon's important. Make that your first buy button, but don't put all your eggs in that single basket. Indeed. Okay. And I did. Um, good point. I'm glad you got on the soapbox there. Um, I haven't experimented um, at all with the Walmart affiliate program. Um, but I saw that you guys do have functionality for it. So it, it is just a matter of like, oh, if you want to get this product or a type of product, um, you can go to Walmart, go to Amazon, like pick your poison, right? Yeah. I mean, I, at the end of the day, I, I shop on Amazon more than I shop on Walmart. But again, 
Walmart, you know, has has put a lot of time and effort. You know, the acquisition of Jet is a, a perfect example. They want to be a, a major player in the e-commerce space. They've got a relatively robust affiliate program. Again, Amazon is is definitely a bit cleaner. Um, Walmart also has a massive catalog and is is really kind of pushing on that third-party marketplace as well. So they're getting just a bigger and bigger marketplace as well. But if you're promoting camera gear, don't do Walmart. Do B and H Photo. Do Newegg. Do Adorama. Yeah, there's you know your space. You know your audience better. Again, Amazon's a great catch-all, but who are the premier players in that space? They likely have an affiliate program. Use some, use more than one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's great advice. I mean, and I'm guilty personally, like you said, prior, prioritization. Uh, I'm a victim of my own prioritization where I've just ignored some stuff. And yeah, there's a lot of risk um, with certain pieces of the business model. And it, it's so easy to fall in that trap. You know, it's so easy once you have a routine, once you have a, a standard operating procedure of how to you know, build pages, add links, et cetera. Um, but then you get you know, a year or two into it, you've got you know, hundreds of pages. You're not going to go back and build hundreds of links. And then you're kind of stuck. And then again, you're, you've fallen into this thing where you, you're very vulnerable. Yeah, again, you're following the rules. You should be fine. But again, there's, there's too many little things that can fall apart quickly. There's a lot of, there's a lot of imperfect humans in the chain of uh, what can go wrong. So exactly. So um, I guess, is there any other like functionality that maybe I'm not aware of with uh, genius, like anything, you know, new, other new things? I mean, you've already uh, mentioned several, <laughs> but I, I don't want to, you know, forget some of the other cool stuff that it can do. For sure. So yeah. Um, where do I start here? We, we, for better or worse, we have this this very diverse client set, right? We, um, again, started in the music space. We have a lot of musicians and authors using our platform. They're more interested in making sure that people are buying their product and less concerned about the uh, commission aspect of it. Um, that's probably not a, a 100% overlap with your audience. We also have um, major brands, um, again, Intel, uh, BMW, et cetera, that are using our platform because they need a little bit more functionality from their links. It, you know, Bitly is a great Link shortening, you know, the, the, the grill in the space, they're the original originator, but all their links will always go to one destination where a dynamic link where you can constantly change your do the different rules. You know, if language is French and country is Canada, go to this landing page versus if country is you know Canada and language is English, you know, go here. So that extra functionality is kind of unlocked a lot of different types of marketers from from taking full advantage of, of um, their marketing campaigns. So there's the advanced target rules are one, but that also plays into another thing that we're seeing a lot of is that again, a website is is really important. But you know, as we're filming this, you know, this this is going to to live on on YouTube, right? Going from YouTube to Amazon can also be a great uh, opportunity. And Amazon is very aware of of the opportunities in social media. But one of the challenges with going from social media uh, to a, a third party destination, which you don't control, is you lose access on some of those. Um, retargeting features. So one of the core features that have become incredibly popular is the ability to add JavaScript JavaScript or retargeting pixels actually into the link. So if someone clicks on the link, we'll actually pause for a fraction of a second, fire some JavaScript for our client, and then redirect them on. So it's still a, a seamless user experience, but now you can build your custom audiences even though you're going from one third party to another third party. Social media, you know, Twitter to Amazon or Twitter to YouTube, etc. And those, those custom audiences, if you're doing any sort of ad buy, um, obviously it's much better to be focused. Someone that has shown interest and intent in your platform or your, you in general is going to be a much better place to target than, than just kind of the spray and pray approach. Take that one step further. You build your custom audience. Uh, Facebook allows you crazy insights into who those are, you know, the socioeconomic status, their, you know, et cetera, stuff that Google analytics doesn't tell you, uh, on top of that. Facebook also allows you to look like audiences, right? So you have a great audience that's monetizing well. You know, do a look like audience, find a new audience. You know, it's much cheaper to do retargeting buys than just a straight spray and pray. So there's a lot of tangential value you can do from from retargeting, even if you are just a just an affiliate. If you're you know, if you're affiliate marketing is is kind of your your piece at the moment, um, especially when you're doing social media. Got it. Interesting. So let me restate that to make sure I understand. So I can have, say, a video on YouTube and put a genius link in there. Someone clicks on it. And then I can have a, you know, a Facebook pixel attached mm -hmm. to that link. Mm -hmm. So I can build an audience through someone clicking on the link. And for the people that don't know, 
um, if I were to build an audience tracking your clicks, then I could then show you ads on Facebook and chase you around <laughs> like on Facebook over and over again until you get sick of seeing my ad or whatever. So that that's what mm -hmm. you could do. Exactly. Exactly. That's um, pretty cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's, that's sick. <laughs> We've a uh, side tangent here. Um, Real estate agents seem to be a, loving this. They'll, Facebook bots seem to be the new tool for real estate agents. So we've had this crazy influx of real estate agents that are using our link specifically for the retargeting feature. You know, they'll send them to a listing or whatever, uh, but they'll they'll yeah, add the retargeting pixel so they can come back and, and make sure that that house they looked at stays front and center for them or their name stays front and center for them as they, they browse the internet. So, um, Lots of lots of different things. So, you know, the advanced targets, you know, being able to target off of language, country, device, et cetera, is, is a key piece. The uh, the retargeting pixels is a key piece and the choice pages are another piece. And there's a handful of other um, things that we offer. But those are kind of like the three main value adds. I guess the auto affiliation and link translation specifically for Amazon. But in general, as a link intelligent link management platform, those are the three features that we see a lot of value in and, you know, kind of overlapping those is been really cool to see clients doing crazy things. You, know, you build a tool and you know, within not too much time, you see people doing things you never thought possible. And that's, that's one of my greatest sources of joy. But again, I'm going off on a tangent now. No, that's what it's all about. Um, yeah, that's, again, that's really cool. Just like, like you said, you, you created some functionality and then someone extends it. And then um, I could imagine, like you said, for real estate agents, like I can see pockets of and verticals of business where basically someone figures out how to do something and then it sort of uh, propagates throughout that industry until the marketers abuse everything and then destroy it and it doesn't work anymore like the exactly the, uh, facebook bots or whatever so right well you have you know gdpr and then you know washington state is looking to do some privacy stuff california is in the process of privacy stuff so there's there's certain yeah, privacy is, this is another, sorry, tangent. Privacy is so important. Yeah, I'm, I'm such a fan of what GDPR aims to do. Um, it definitely complicates things and makes it harder as a marketer. But yeah, there's there's definitely, as as a marketer, we need to be respectful and ethical, you know, use the tools available, don't abuse the tools. But as you said, you know, there are the bad actors out there that make it bad for everyone. Right. Well, and I guess if we're talking about tangents, like with the GDPR, like I was just, I tried and I updated some things, but I was just like, this is the worst website experience ever. Like, just forget it. I, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong, but I'm not, I'm pretty sure I'm not doing all the disclosures that I'm supposed to. Um, but at the same time, it's like, all right, the age that we live in now, like you basically have no privacy and like, what do they say? If it's, if it's, uh, if it's a free you're product, not for it. Yeah, you're the you product. It. So it's exactly. like, come on people. If, if you're using Facebook for free or you're watching YouTube videos, like you're the product, sorry. Like that's just how it is. Or you could pay right. And get mm -hmm. out of that. But that, that's my rant. So <laughs> you don't have to say Actually. anything on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Any, any other things you want to share about the company or, uh, functionality? Like what were you guys heading in the next say 18 months? Yeah. Um, we got, we got some crazy plans. We're doing some really cool stuff. So there's, if we, if we kind of riff off that, that tangent that we had earlier where, you know, diversifying your revenue is important, but again, doing a standard operating procedure of how to build your site so that it's, it's easy to do and that you can have a, a VA do it. Those two things are, are really important. So we, we're really working on making it as easy as possible for us, for you to give us one link for us to find that same product in other ecosystems for this, then to build a, a choice page seamlessly, put the information that's relevant then also pull in the different affiliate programs that are relevant so you can monetize that. So at the end of the day, we want the user interaction or the client interaction to be the same. You give us a, you recommend a product and for us to take care of all those other pieces to ensure that you um, are again, diversifying your revenue, that you're monetizing all the different pieces and you're optimizing not only across the U S but also across the world. So that's, that's kind of the 18 month vision. We've, uh, we've been kicking butt on it. There's just a lot of different pieces to do. Um, believe it or not, it's actually really challenging to take a link for a, you know, Amazon, a microphone, Amazon to find that same product inside Walmart and Newegg. But we've, um, we've actually got five patents on being able to do exactly that. And it's, it's just a, a matter of time and work, but it's, uh, it's a lot of work to get there. So 
take a deep breath. We're going to get there. I'm really excited. But yeah, there's some really cool stuff coming where a Genius Link should be a whole lot more intelligent than it has in the past. Awesome. Do you have any time time frame on that or just like the general 18 month given all the hurdles one has to go through? The goal is to to iterate, um, you know, be able to launch something every few months. So uh, the monetization aspect is kind of the, well, we spent a lot of last year working on making the choice pages a lot better, a lot easier to build, um, a lot more efficient. So that was kind of one step. The next piece is to to open up this other monetization pieces, right? So we added uh, native support for the Walmart affiliate program and B&H affiliate program. We also allowed um, you to integrate uh, not only skim links, but also Vic link uh, as kind of catch-alls as well. So if you have a link to um, Adidas or or Newegg, we don't natively support those affiliate programs right now. But if you had Viglink or Skimlinks added, we'll see that they they can affiliate that for you. So now with the Genius Link platform, you can build a link anywhere. We can make sure it's affiliated correctly through those those partnerships. Uh, the next step for us is to add significantly more uh, affiliate programs. So we're building out a infrastructure that will allow us to support not single or tens, but hundreds of different affiliate programs relatively easily. Uh, and then from there, we'll transition over to go back to work on that kind of back-end matching. So again, you give us an Amazon link, we can find it in Walmart, we can find it in Newegg, et cetera. Um, and then it's back to the choice page to make sure that all the relevant data is there so that we can give you pricing, availability, shipping, et cetera, for each of those different pieces. So it's kind of, you know, feedback loops where each one kind of builds on the next to kind of give the whole tool more, more value. Yeah. And that, by the way, that is a huge amount of value if people don't realize, like, I think the only way to have done that in the past is to just brute force manually, like add those links, or you have a custom software solution. Um, so uh, people think about maybe uh, like the wire cutter or something mm -hmm. like exactly. It, it's all, you know, it's a multi-million dollar company. It's huge. There's hundreds of employees or whatever. And they have like custom software solutions to do what you're talking about. The, the secret is that it's not all software. They have a lot of people that are actually yeah, doing it manually. Um, oh, they are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're, as far as we understand, the, um, let me take a step back. When, when you do matching, and this is, again, one of our special sauce things. When you do matching, there's a couple different levels at which you match at. And we have it built out um, in kind of a series. So I actually have, a, you know, I was going to see it. We have a, some of the, the, the diagrams from the patents in uh, frames, and they're not actually in this conference room. But we have a, a series of cascading algorithms to be able to do that matching. The first one is essentially what we call exact match. An exact match is when the IDs will be the same. So if the ASIN is the same between Amazon.com and Amazon.co.uk, or the uh, EIN, or the G10, or the UPC, you know, all these unique identifiers for a product, when those are the same, that's the easiest level of matching. Um, and that's obviously the first one you should check for because it's the same. And then more often than not, it's, it's the right product. There, there are contingencies there. But from what we've seen in the past, that's where most people stop. We have another five levels past that where we've actually, you know, we boil the product down and, and kind of look at the metadata, look at, at how it's built up to, to be able to kind of translate back and forth. So, again, back to manual versus programmatic. Programmatic, it's easy to do the exact match level. Um, not a lot of people have put the time and effort and energy into kind of doing those other pieces. In fact, um, we really only see one or two and it's not wire cutter. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And I was going to say, I mean, like when you're going to that level, like you're actually a lot of times when people ask me a question, I'm like, if you think of the, and I don't know the answer, I'm like, if you think of the end user and like what they would want, that is what you're trying to deliver. So maybe the microphone in this example is mm -hmm. not available in that geography, but you find one with specs that are pretty close that should help the visitor right and that's mm -hmm. that's what you want to do so just to riff off that real quick we versus our competitors do have tweaked our priorities a little bit user experience always comes first for us monetization comes second and this you know for example um you may be signed up for the amazon uk affiliate program and you get a click from the uk if we're not comfortable with the results that we've got we're not going to send to the UK. We're not going to give that user a bad experience. We're not going to give them an empty search results page. We're not going to send them to the wrong product, et cetera. We'll actually go back, excuse me, we call it return to original. Um, we're going to go back to the amazon.com page. It's not ideal, but it's the best user experience. Even though you have the affiliate program, they're coming from the UK, we're not going to give a shitty user experience, bad user experience. Um, you could cut us, it's fine. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so user experience always comes before monetization because we feel, and again, this is very much where our values are aligned with Amazon, is that that, that customer experience is paramount. If, if the end consumer is not getting what they want, then you have failed. 100%. Period. Nice. Very good. All right. Well, um, Jesse, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you taking the time with the Niche Site Project audience. And um, yeah, if people have questions, feel free to either... Uh, leave them in the comments of the video. You could email them over to me at feedback at doug.show and all that stuff. And um, I imagine, Jesse, we can probably chat about some other stuff in the future. Um, I do want to give you a quick compliment uh -oh. before we move on um, and, and let you, you know, say your final words here. Um, the blog content over at Genius Link over the past, um, you know, little stretch really uh like you guys really upped your game that's what i'm, what I'm trying to say like uh <laughs> tons you. of good content everyone check out the blog there um i think it's fantastic tons of good info thank you education is so important um i thank you that means a lot to us all right and uh, of course people could find you actually where do you want people to find you or connect with you or anything like that for sure. Um, so if you go to geni.us slash uh, Jesse, um, that is my choice page for, for me. So you have my Instagram, you have my Facebook, you have my LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. So that's probably the easiest way to, to find me is geni.us slash Jesse. All right. And I'll put a link in uh, the description and show notes so people can find it easily. And uh, thanks again, Jesse. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for the time. Cheers. All right, thanks a lot to Jesse and Genius Link. If you haven't checked out Genius Link before, I highly encourage you to have a look at it. I am an affiliate, there's a link in the description. So if I refer you over there and you use it, I get a commission if you become like a paying customer. So I encourage you to check out the blog over there. It's very good as well. A lot of good content. They've stepped up their content game in the last um, year or so, and it's, it's really excellent. I actually guest posted over there um, in the past. So thanks again, and we'll catch you on the next episode.